Welcome to our Monday Thursday worship as we come together and partake of the Holy Lord's Supper. May we know that God is present in our midst and that God is calling us as servant people. Please check the dates for and time of our worship services. Uh, for tomorrow, Good Friday, we have a cantata, and it will start at 3 in the afternoon, from silence to song. And on Easter Sunday, sunrise service will be at 5 in the morning, and we have the regular service at 9.30, which where we would receive into, into our fold the confirmation class as well as new members. And right after the 9.30 service, we will have the Easter egg hunt. Let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship God. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. The hour has come, we gather, to recall the story of the night Jesus was betrayed. The hour has come, are you prepared? We are ready to journey with Christ. We are here to receive the life and light of Christ. Darkness once over the earth, Darkness was with God's people caused by temptation and sin. Come, honor the one who comes in the name of the Lord to redeem and cleanse us from all sin. God, God of all, all grace, grace and steadfast love, greatly is your name to be praised in all the earth. Bring us to this feast of remembrance with open hearts. together. Holy One, we strive to live as you have shown us, yet we cannot make it on our own. 
You gather us just like the disciples long ago. You called us just as how you called the sinners in the crowd who desired to be healed and restored. You listened to us and invited us, even if there are times when we deny your grace, when we are called to testify but never speak, when at the garden we too walk away from you. We recognize that we have sinned, yet you call us friends. Humble and make us ready to celebrate this moment, remembering your suffering for our sake. Break the walls that separate us from you, Lord, and let this moment be a night to remember your sacrifice and obedience. Teach us to remember this night with grace and humility. Amen. Now the hour has come, as written in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26, verses 22 to 25, that it says, And while they were eating, he said, Truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to him, to one after the other, Surely you don't mean me, Lord? Jesus replied, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely you don't name me, Rabbi? Jesus answered, You have said so. As Jesus prepares his body to be broken on our behalf, let us confess to the ways that we have betrayed him in word and in deed. Let us together say our prayer of confession. Surely not I, Lord, yet we know in many ways we betray and deny you. We ask for guidance but never obey. Surely not I, Lord, a perfect follower of Jesus. Cleanse me, O God, from wickedness. Convict my heart and guide me to confess my unrighteousness, for I am broken. Grant us peace from the troubles we face. Give us confidence, Lord, as we come to you this hour. You remain the God who is good. Renew us, cleanse us, and restore us.
Jesus said, I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. And having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Friends, the good news, therefore, is this. In Jesus Christ, we are loved and we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. I request those who are able to please stand in reverence to the reading of God's Word, taken from the Gospel of John, chapter 13, verses 1 to 17. And it says, Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, You do not know what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, One who has bathed does not need to wash, except for the feet, but he is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you, for he knew who was to betray him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe, and had returned to the table, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Very truly, I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may now be seated.
come to the table of mercy. Thank you, Pilgrim Choir, Alexi and Lang Lang, for the anthem. Let us pray. Come to us, O God. Speak to us. Touch us with your Holy Spirit. Prepare us as we come to the table. Amen. Looking at the life of Jesus and his ministry through the gospel stories, we can see Jesus loving to paint portraits for the soul through his actions as well as his words. In fact, his whole life is a powerful illustration. In the passage that we just read, the image that Jesus portrayed will always be remembered by the disciples and us today. It is so powerful that we will never again be able to think of him without referring to this event. The atmosphere of that evening was shrouded in mystery and filled with intrigue. There was the meal held in secret, a carefully plotted plan. Listen, the householder said, let us have use a signal. I'll send a man with a jar of water through the city. Now, during that time, women were the usual ones who carried jars of water. Men used wineskins. And he said, have your disciples follow him. No words, no talk. I'll furnish the upper room. One by one, the, the disciples followed the man with a jar of water, trudging along dusty streets to celebrate the Passover with Jesus. They probably did not know that this was their last supper with him. They entered the house and waited for the Lord to come. As they were seated, there was an argument, a heated discussion of who among them was the greatest in the kingdom that Jesus would establish. You know, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, they were sure that the demonstration of the people that accompanied Jesus entry into Jerusalem would thrust Jesus into the political forefront and initiate the coming of his kingdom. And so they were hustling to be in the position of the greatest power. Each had reasons for assuming that he would play a major role in the kingdom of God. The discussion prevented them from carrying out the foot cleansing one usually engages upon entering a home. Now, because the roads were dusty with animal dung and garbage, and people were, wore sandals, everyone who came into the house entered with, with filthy feet. You know, they sat on the floor around a table, unlike the ones that we see on paintings. There was just a, uh, a table where they sat on the floor, carpeted floor, of course, and they would surround the table and they would eat. Now, you know, they sat on the floor around the table with their feet near their heads of those next to them. And it would be yucky to be eating near the dirty and smelly feet of someone else. Normally, a servant, the lowest person in the staff, was assigned the dismal duty of removing the sandals and washing the feet of each one who arrives. The disciples, seeing that there was no one present to carry out the task, knew that they should take turns at that wretched job. But nobody moved. They all sat there with dirty feet, 
discussing about who was the most important in the kingdom of Jesus. Nobody took the basin and no one reached for a towel. Each one, waiting to be served, refused to stoop and wash the other's feet. There they sat, self-satisfied and sullen, until Jesus came. Now, Jesus must have sensed what was going on. His hands gripped the basin and tied the towel around his waist, calmly and lovingly began to wash their feet. They must have been shocked watching their Lord carrying out the menial task. In this act, Christ became the servant. Imagine, just imagine, God's Son on his knees because of the arrogance of the disciples. This must have been an image they could not forget. When he finished, he said to them, do you understand what I have just done for you? Now, the disciples most likely nodded their collective heads, but I doubt whether they really and truly understood what Jesus was saying to them. And Jesus went on to say, you call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now I, your Lord and teacher, have set an example that you should do as I have done for you. Now, I believe that Jesus was not suggesting that they go about the countryside washing people's feet. That would miss the point. You know, the custom of foot washing in some churches today is a mere practice of piety or just a reminder for us to serve others. He wanted them to know that the highest calling in life is not to be served, but to serve. God called them and us today to minister to the needs of others. For Jesus, that is leadership. That is the way Jesus used his power and authority. And that is the way the disciples are to operate in this world. You know, our weakest moments as a community of equals appeal to us because of our insecurities and belligerence. We do not want anyone telling us what to do. And so we are up to sacrifice the common good for our ego and accompany it with all kinds of pious chatter. Power in itself is not an evil thing, nor is the pursuit of it incompatible with God's design. The passion to learn and the pursuit of excellence, evidence of our desire for power, have been implanted in us as part of the divine image. Jesus promised power to the apostles before he ascended. What is at issue here is not power as such, but how we use the power. Jesus saw power as an instrument, not of control, but of caring as a vehicle, not of submission, but of servanthood. Here, Jesus is showing us servant leadership. Jesus, by reaching out to the basin and the towel, shows his disciples of his love for them. And even if he knew that they would betray him, desert him that night, and that he would be brought to trial and finally crucified, while the disciples were thinking only of themselves, Jesus, on the other hand, emptied himself and gave himself to those for whom he cared. The servant does not ask, what do others think of me? Jesus saw the need. He rolled up his sleeves. He grabbed the basin and the towel, and he went to work. In this humble but powerful way, Jesus began to transform the thinking of his disciples. You know, I was just observing these young people having this hibalag. Just this afternoon, 
they were working together. I saw them blindfolded, and one at the back was the one leading them, tapping at the shoulder and the head. I see the servant leadership. I see them doing what Jesus was doing with his disciples. Like the disciples, it is hard for us to understand because we tend to use power as a show of force to manipulate, to get what we want. If we go back to history, we will see the struggle between the two approaches to the use of power, between the manipulator and the servant. Some would demand from others to submit themselves to their ideas, utilize their language, and conform to their concepts of what they want others to do. On the other hand, some selfishly serve others, communicating to them the grace of God, which can bring us together in ways that will make us great and strong. God calls each of us to follow the example of Jesus by expanding their lives in servanthood and service. That was clearly the message as Jesus instituted the sacrament of the Holy Communion. In giving the bread and wine, Jesus said to his disciples, I am giving myself to you. From that moment on, when they received the Lord's Supper, they were reminded that they had also been called to give themselves for others. Today, the living Lord approaches us as we come to the Lord's table and says to us, here, take and eat. This is my body. Take this cup and divide it among yourselves. And Jesus is asking us to keep doing this so we will never forget that a servant Lord continues to give, give, and to give. The Lord's Supper is living proof of God's expensive love that he did not count the cost but gave us everything he had to give. Fatigue and personal pains are disregarded as Jesus stoops to serve. What he gives is not the leftovers of his life or the time he has to spare. He gives from the depths of his being, of his sweat, of his strength, and ultimately of his own body and blood. In this dynamic experience, we become recipients of God's power and grace. Many of us have been coming to Monday, Thursday for, for years, and few probably do not know where the word Monday comes from. Monday comes from the Latin word mandatum, which means commandment. At the end of the Last Supper, Jesus gave us a new commandment. In verses 34 and 35, we read this commandment. A new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So the scene drawn by Jesus that night in the upper room was one of a powerful servant motivated by an unrelenting love. He loved without embarrassment, without reservation. He loved without requiring love in return. Despite the stubborn pride of his disciples, Jesus went to work. He said long ago to the disciples, do you know what I have done? I have given you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. So that I was sent to serve, so I send you. Thus tonight, a little piece of bread, a sip of wine or juice, when blessed by the Spirit, is enough to nourish us for the life of a servant leader. More like Jesus, less of us.
trading your crown for the cross you willingly died your innocent life pay the cost counting your status as nothing the king of all kings came to serve washing my feet covering me with your love if more of you means less of me take every Yes, all of you is all I need. Take everything. You are my life and my treasure.
God offered his son for our redemption. Christ offered his blood for our purification. Let us now offer to God the purest of our hearts through tithes and other pledges as our act of gratitude for God's grace.
our offertory prayer together. Receive our offering of thanksgiving, loving God. Bless this gift to be used for the ministry you wanted us to do. We commit our trust and faith in Jesus Christ, just as you have revealed the Son to us. Amen. Maybe you see it. If your faith is weak and your doubts are strong, if your motives are questionable and your spirituality leaves something to be desired, if your life will not stand up to careful examination, then you are invited to the Lord's table. You may be surprised to discover that as you partake of the elements, it is not so much how we come to Christ as how Christ comes to us, which makes the reconciling and renewing presence of God real in our lives. God, through Christ, comes to us where we are, in the eating from the common loaf and drinking from the common cup. Let us pray. God of heaven and earth, we stretch our arms in need of you and we feed ourselves with gifts from you. As we partake of the sacred elements, recreate us in your image so that our lives might ignite a love to light the world where despair drips with dreary or drowning dreams and where heavy hearts shiver in lonely cold. Let this be an instrument of your love infusing the world with joy and peace. Amen. On the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread. He broke it. And after giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body which is broken for you. After supper, he also took the cup, poured wine in the cup, and he gave it to his disciples saying, drink all of it. This is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you eat this bread and drink from this cup, you will always be reminded of our Lord's death until he comes.
Christ invites us all to the table of grace, to the table of mercy. You are loved by God. Come, partake of the sacred elements.
let us pray. We thank you, God, that you have provided for all of us by giving yourself in love. If we go to the heights of the mountains or if we make the grave our bed, you are with us. If we go to the depths of the sea, your right hand holds us fast. We thank you for Jesus, your word, who lived among us, uncovering your presence through him. You stamp his death with victory and that life, that death was the final word. It is through Jesus whom you call us to be servant people. And now bless us that some unbounded love and so be encouraged to be your servants to the world. Amen. Gracious God, we would appear before you with either empty hands or empty lives, yet however much we give seems too little in the view of the amazing gift of your Son. Forgive us for our stinginess of life and possessions, for the sake of him who loved us and gave himself for us all. And so tonight we come, rededicating ourselves to serve you as servant people. May we respond to your call and thus instruments of your love that you had shown on the cross. For a world broken by struggles for power, we pray the experience of your love and that reconciles. For a world that is full of suffering, we pray for hands ready to serve. For persons made lonely by the death of a loved one or friend, we pray the assurance of your presence. For those suffering sickness and in Infirmity. We pray for your strength and health. And for those wrestling with difficult decisions, we pray for guidance. And now we ask that you grant to each one of us present here a commitment to ministry that whatever task we have may not be a burden but a delight. Through him whom to know is perennial joy, even though 
it brings crosses to bear. Go forth from this place, servant people, aware of the world's darkness, yet reaching for the light. Go forth, servant leaders. Leave this place as serving people, sensing new the pain we so many bear, yet confident that God will bring healing even through you. Go forth, opening yourselves as channels of God's grace and love. Go, servant leaders, in the name of God, our Creator, Redeemer and Sustainer. Amen.
Our scripture reading is taken from...